Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 579th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have Ryan Dorn. He is the author of Selling Forward, Pandemic Tested Sales Strategies for Success. Very interesting. Um, he is an award-winning speaker. Um, he reached out to me. I liked what I saw. Um, we hit it off right away. Uh, we get into millennials. We get into relationship selling. Um, <laughs> why buyers would rather go to the dentist than talk to you if you're in sales. So uh, a lot of good things. And uh, he, he throws around some big numbers, some, um, some bold claims, but he backs them up. So uh, it's good stuff. Uh, like I mentioned in the intro to the last episode, um, 578 with Todd Capone, um, I'm preloading a couple of these. It's a few hours later. I've been doing 27 different things to get ready. So just so you know, May 27th, 1992, I graduated from the Air Force Academy. We are the only class in our entire history. I was in Squadron 34, and that was we were the 34th graduating class in 92. We're still the only class to not have the Thunderbirds fly because the weather was so bad. Our, our service, our ceremony was delayed several hours. Dan Quayle was the vice president back then. His flight got uh, rerouted, so that screwed everything up. And um, it was foggy. Uh, I want to say it was 41, <clears throat> 41 degrees, but... I don't know. I've slept since then. It was cold, and I was hung over like a dog. I didn't have all the right clothing, so I had just a, a T-shirt, right? I call them a wife beater T-shirt. Uh, don't kill me. All right, it's just a slang term. Uh, and our wool parade uniforms, and I was frozen. And uh, I was talking about my buddy. I was in my best man at my wedding. I was best man at his wedding. He and I sat in his car. He had a truck, I think with the heater on for as long as we could and um, jumped out there. And every May 27th, somebody shares pictures from the newspapers of, um, you know, we're, they're telling us have a seat, right? So we're tilting the seats and wiping them down. We got white gloves on, but we wore white pants. So imagine some of the potential scenes sitting down with white pants on cold, wet seats. Uh, but now they're saying we got cold weather and rain potentially coming. Certainly chillier weather. So it's going from like 92 to 60s, low in the 40s, chance of rain. So now I got to pack differently. So you know I'm in a mood. Uh, I got my parking lined up though. Just trying out clear. I don't feel if y'all are using clear, let me know. I started a 60 day free trial. I've been TSA pre for years, and that's been fantastic. So we're trying out this clear. So we shall see. So bang this one out. Uh, I'm also releasing uh, the Sin Spark episode on the CRM Sushi podcast with Bethany. Uh, she we went live with her episode uh, 573, and I just fell behind on knocking out some others for the wedding last week. So uh, I'll get hers get it get that out there as well. So you know she is sending helping you send uh, video emails, but She's got a unique twist. A, it's super affordable. B, uh, you can personalize segments and then kind of splice them together. So you can take a, um, a standard you know, demo or featured item and do a, a quick intro and personalize it so it's cool, right? And uh, so the URL I have for that, it's a subdomain, right? These are affiliate links, so I can get paid a couple nickels. But it is sendspark.thesalespodcast.com. So go check that out. All right. Uh, check out what John's doing over at the Charm Offensive. Send you some drunk emails. Drunk.thesalespodcast.com. And uh, the last one I'll mention is my new program, totally free. 12 weeks to peak.com. Make this the last hard business quarter of your life. All right. 12, the number 12, 12 weeks to peak.com. Now let's bring on Ryan. Ryan Dorn. Okay, man, you're the, my first, well, or maybe you're not my first Emmy winning. Well, I've had PR people. Though, so you're my first Emmy winning sales training guy, knuckle dragging salesman like me, you know, <laughs> on the show, man. Welcome. 
Hey, thanks so much. Sometimes I, I used to keep the trophy nearby so I could show it to people as they thought you were lying. Um, but yeah, they do give Emmy Awards for sales and marketing. And that was in Chicago uh, when Ooh. I was uh, doing some work for WLS TV, Channel 7. Very and nice. there's these Emmy, Award, uh, Emmy Awards, Wes, that people win. Um, it's not just the Susan Lucci's of the world that win for Days of Our Lives or whatever. There's there's these uh, sales blokes and marketing folks that win uh, as well. So my son said the other day, though, hey, uh, that Emmy thing was, you know, uh, early 2000s. How long are you going to keep hanging your hat on that? And I, I said, okay, well, I guess I need to come up with something new to impress my son, I guess. <laughs> hey, I still tell people I was I was like all city in, in fifth grade, you know, my, my first year playing basketball. So, I mean, you know, if Al Bundy can hold on to it, you and I can. Whatever it, ta- whatever it takes um, to perpetuate the illusion of knowledge um, to which has become my career uh, up, up to this man. point. So, <laughs> yeah, man, that's badass. Yeah. So, um, got your new book here, Selling Forward Pandemic Tested Sales Strategies for Success. Yeah. Paid a lot Are of we money. Still in the pandemic. We're still suffering, man. We're under the, the thumb. Uh, is this, is it truly tested or is this premature? Is it, are you like an Emmy guy? You're just trying to sell us. Are you? No, are you yes. Pulling my leg? Yes. So I am here to sell you today uh, on the book for so many reasons, but um, to talk about what I thought was going to be, I thought the pandemic was going to come to an end, West. I really, Wes, I really did. Oh, um, foolish know, man. You know, yes. Come on. I, I, I thought we were going to be done with this because um, once I got the jab and once I started traveling again, I thought we were done. Right. Mm. And then what I realized was that all these variants kept popping up and then we roll into a, a new administration in the White House and then we roll into economic uncertainty, which I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just stating some facts. And we get to a point now where I thought, wow, pandemic's over. Time to move on. What I realized is all that happened during the pandemic where I helped my coaching clients sell, et cetera, it set us up for a nice path forward. Little did I think that these ideas from the book were going to translate into, hey, they're working when people become economically uncertain. Here, Here's the thing, Wes, pandemic or not, um, you know, uh, the economic uncertainty or not, we've got people that are now emotional. They're not taking risks. They've got tunnel vision. And whether you're selling media, advertising, widgets, software, tech, or whatever, we're dealing with a lot of people that have a, a myopic view of the future, very tunnel visioned, only want to look in front of them. And the the amount of, of trust and faith in salespeople is remarkably low right now. We've got 89%, according to SAP, of people that would rather go to the dentist than talk to a sales professional. And I don't mind going to the dentist, but I think that's pretty darn sad, my friend, that 89% of buyers surveyed by SAP would rather go to the dentist than talk to a sales professional. That's a little sad in my book, Hmm. in my world. Well, okay. A sales professional or a sales person? Because there's a (laughs) difference. Yeah, we could differentiate between the two. I would say for this particular statistic, we'll lump them all together is what we'll do for this particular yeah. statistic. <laughs> I mean, because unfortunately they are different. I guess fortunately, because if they were all good, then you and I wouldn't have a job, huh? Right. True. And uh, if this job was easy, you know, everybody would be doing it uh, and they're not. So I don't think I used to say um, at the end of, of my podcast, if sales was easy, everybody would do it. Um, we're a little crazy and that's OK. And I've kind of changed that to be sort of we're the chosen few because um you know, I've been broke a couple times in my career. I do have a rich uncle, uh, by the way. I could have asked oh. him for a bailout. It's always nice to have. I wish but I, I didn't. It, yeah. Is, is he willing to adopt? Is he looking like <laughs> foster, foster nephews? He very well might be. He's I'm a really cute. nice guy. I'm cute. Yeah. I'm funny. He's a really nice guy. And I understand you're uh, quite the uh, you're quite the babysitter uh, as well. Right. You can take care of hey. your own children and I, your dog. My kids live for five days without their mother being around here. So <laughs> I got that going for me. It's been... Uh, it's been sales, my friend, that has bailed me out. It's been a lot of hard work. Um, it's hard work to write a book, as you know, but it also is important work because so many folks are struggling right now because the buyer pool is completely risk adverse. They're emotional as I'll get out. So on Friday afternoons, the 70 some odd folks that I coach, I have them fill out a little digital digital survey. And what they do on Fridays is they report back to me one of three things. Did the people you met with, the buyers you met with this last week, what percentage were emotional? What percentage were logical? What percentage were just ego-driven buyers? And so every Friday they fill out this survey. And what's interesting is so uh, last Friday, 
Um, we're at uh, almost 70% of the people reported back to me that they were dealing with emotional buyers. So what's interesting is that that is that is as high or almost as high as the midst of the pandemic, phase one pandemic. So what I'm really concerned about and the reason I wrote the book and the reason I'm talking to folks and speaking about it is typically you sell okay, the way that you buy. So if you buy from a logical perspective, you typically sell with data and numbers. It's all logic. What I find though is the majority of salespeople are logical. Uh, they sell logically with data, facts, and stats, Wes. What I don't find that they're able to do is move and shift from being a logical seller to an emotional seller with stories, anecdotes, uh, proof, a lot of social proof. I feel like they're always focusing in on their numbers. So because of that, they're a mismatch for the 70 some percent of buyers right now that are crazy, crazy emotional. And so I'm trying to work with reps to be a lot more emotional in their sales approach. And unfortunately, what I'm running into is a lot of folks just don't want to shift. They always have been logical. They've always wanted to do it that way. And so what I find is they don't want to shift over to an emotional sales strategy, which is a lot less questions and is a lot more emotional. It's just harder, you know, for them to, to do that. Interesting. Yeah. I always say, you know, we have to meet our prospects where they are. So true. Right. But, uh, but yeah, salespeople like, you know, the prospects like, yeah, I'm ready to buy. You're like, oh no, I'm only on slide three. <laughs> I got 87 more of these things to show you before you can buy from me. Like, what? Right. <laughs> take a deep breath, back, you know, put I'm um, tighten up the, the seatbelt and get ready for the ride that I'm going to take you on as a salesperson. Like, take their money and run. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's interesting like, that, you know, salespeople are typically like we're known as the Gregorious outgoing. Oh, you've never met a stranger. You're great with people. But you should be in sales. Yeah, you should be in sales. And then, but you're talking about, you know, how logical and it's funny. There's a book, you know, wake me. What is it? Wake me when the data's over. Right. You know, so <laughs> why do these outgoing, gregarious, golfing, going out to dinner, scotch drinking salespeople just stick to the facts? Yeah, you would think that they would totally understand that um, the the sale happens when you're able to deeply connect with somebody, earn trust and respect with them, um, and you're able to prove to them that you your value proposition is strong, you're able to prove to them that you can bring value to the occasion. And so much of that now, especially when you're dealing with younger buyers, um, is all about an emotional connection. And maybe they just don't want to have that connection or, or they think, oh, I have to have a relationship with somebody to sell them. Millennials don't want to have a relationship with you. I don't know mm -hmm. how how much more I can say to folks that are selling they, the relationship will come, but they don't have to have a relationship from you to buy from you. There's three things that most millennial buyers want. And I hate single, not millennials because boy, they've made me a better salesperson because they demand transparency. And I'm kind of full of baloney. I've been doing this a long time. Um, they don't have to, you know, I remember back in the day, Wes, maybe you do as well, where you'd end up at places you shouldn't be with clients late at night to build that relationship to get <laughs> things done. <laughs> And now it's sort so, of like, <laughs> all right. So it's about 2002, somewhere around there. I'm in Atlanta at a conference. We were living in Austin. My wife's from California. She lived, lived a very sheltered life. And I call her and, I, and it's late, but she's a couple hours behind, right? Or at least one hour behind. Right. And, uh, I said, you'll never guess where we are. She says, what? I said, she's like, give me a hint. I said, there's a sign that says, I forget, like, it's like hot, fresh now. Oh, she's yeah. She's like, mm -hmm. you're at a strip club? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I'm at Krispy Kreme. I'm the Krispy, you know, yeah. Krispy Kreme, right? Yeah, Krispy Kreme. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's, well, what we, have a, we have a running joke, my wife and I do, whenever we are out to dinner. We always have to drive by the Krispy Kreme as we head home. I live outside of Augusta, Georgia. And um, as we head home, and if the light is on, the we big go. flashing light, we got to pull in, at least get two donuts for the ride home. If the light's not on, it's a sign from God that we're supposed to keep right on going. <laughs> I said, well, maybe because I'm carrying this extra weight, the sign should be reversed. If the sign from God is don't eat donuts, the sign is on saying don't eat donuts, right? Um, so far, we've never followed the, we've always followed the sign. Being on means we have to eat more of those donuts. All right, all right. 
The relationship piece, though, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that people don't want a relationship and a relationship won't come. But typically, most of my younger buyers want to know three things. How much is it? Has anybody else tried it? Oh, and by the way, how much is it? And when I try to take them down a path more than that, it tends to get a little sideways with all this fake rapport building and things like that. Now, you say millennials, but Mm -hmm. it seems like we know that like trends or fads or whatever, the younger people tend to start them, but they are adopted by the older generations, because I feel like everybody's kind of more in this mode than 20 years ago. Fair enough. You seeing that? Yep. Yeah, I think we've got a different. So I heard a a gentleman speak about this, uh, the different age groups, and he said, let's be let's break it down and make it simple. There's two groups of people out there, young folks and old folks. And if you don't know which group you're in, you're old. That's what he said. So um, I feel like that's a fair that's a fair statement. But I also think we need to be looking at sales professionals, salespeople out there at, okay, what's what's changing um, and in terms of selling? Some things that have changed during the pandemic, people realized, number one, they can buy with from us without ever meeting us. They might meet us on a Zoom call, but we used to be that it required a salesperson to inform you. Well, now 70 some percent of buyers want to find out their information online before they ever talk to a salesperson. Mm-hmm. So we are you know, living in a little bit different world from a sales you know, uh, perspective. Um, but one of the biggest takeaways, hopefully, that people get for our, from our conversation today is if you typically sell the way that you buy or you buy the way that you sell, if you're working with somebody that's emotional, um, you're going to have to take an emotional sales route to get to the close as opposed to trying to force somebody, force your numbers on somebody. And I just wish more people would just look online, do some research and figure out, like I could figure out who you are by looking at your LinkedIn profile, Wes. It's not like you're, uh, well, you're, you know, you're pretty open. You're not hidden at all, but do a little research. The number of people that show up unprepared to sales calls. I had a guy, nice guy, Jesse on a sales call. He said, um, Ryan, thanks for the time today. No problem, Jesse. He says, Ryan, tell me a little bit about yourself. I said, well, Jesse, what do you already know? I mean, just to save time, what do you already know? Well, you know, Ryan, it's a question I like to ask folks. Tell me about yourself. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you did no research before the sales call. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I believe young and old people think it's, you want to show up prepared. You want to be ready to roll. But I think if you're going to connect with folks, there's too much technology out there not to be researched before you get on a on a phone call to know that somebody's dog's name is Maisie. It's not that hard to read, right? But people just don't do it. At least I hope um, that's your dog's name. <laughs> That's my dog's name. Crazy Maisie. <laughs> yeah. And I know I tell people that all the time, but Hey, like I said, if, if everybody did it, we wouldn't have a job. Yeah. Fair so, enough. I mean, everybody's looking for shortcuts. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast, right? That we're looking for instant gratification, shortcuts, hacks, cutting corners. It's entropy, right? Water follows the path of least resistance. And so do humans. Right. Um, you know, it's crazy, but, you know, I do like your, your approach on, you know, looking at how, you know, the pandemic did change things. The crazy thing though, I mean, I've worked from home for 22 years, you know, I've worked for myself from right. home for 16 years. Um, I've met like 2% of my clients ever. Right. You know, I like being home. Um, yeah. and I've said no to a lot of things that, uh, probably would have helped me business wise, but it's like, I guess I was given a free pass to an event uh, in Los Angeles and LA is 90 minutes away. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> I went to church, took two naps, uh, went for a swim, got some sun, read for a couple of hours, you know, and had dinner with the family. You know, my new daughter-in-law came over, my in-laws came over and it's like, yeah, I'm not going. I mean, it was a $150 right. pass. So it's like, yeah, it wasn't some, you know, insignificant thing. Yeah. Um, So like when COVID hit, you know, it's like, uh, it barely affected me. (laughs) I was like, oh, hell, Uh, there was less traffic. I got busier. I got busier during COVID because um, so people say, how did COVID affect your business? Uh, When times are tough, um, guys like you and I get real busy because people need advice and they need help with how to deal with these things. 
We're almost to a point now, though, where we've got virtual meeting tune out where people are just oh, not yeah. sharing their cameras. They're not wanting to be on a virtual meeting. And so maybe we'll see a shift of getting back to trade shows and getting face to face with folks again. I think we um, are. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's shifting back towards that. It may never be or it may take a decade to get back to previous levels. But, yeah, I think it's it's getting there. Uh, people are fed up and, you know, they've been lied to and, and people are finally waking up. I've always said, you know, people are sheep, but even a sheep, you punch it in the nose enough times, the thing's going to bite you, you know, yeah. it's like, I'm tired of you punching me. Yeah. Um, so uh, no, I agree. You know, yeah. I had a conversation um, this morning. I uh, had a group of about 17, 18 folks um, on the line as we were just talking through what does economic uncertainty mean? Because just bringing up the word recession, 50% of the group you know, wanted to lose their minds. And I said, well, okay, guys, let's not, friends, let's not talk politics. Then let's just talk about economic uncertainty. What does it mean? And they said, well, why don't you tell us? And I said, well, I usually don't talk um, you know, about uh, expensive things that I do. But I did go and fill my car up last night. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and exactly. the simple fact is, whether you believe there's a recession in play or not, um, economic uncertainty is real. And so because of that... The level of risk tolerance is so unbelievably low in the sales business that if you don't use a lot of social proof, a lot of name dropping to get your point across, it's kind of just you as a salesperson against the world. But our mothers, fathers, et cetera, whoever raised you kind of taught, taught us don't name drop. It's not good form. It's bad form to name drop. Well, now the kids have labeled it social proof, which is awesome. So I'll, I'll steal it. Social proof is our ability to mention the names of other customers we're working with that we love, that we've helped, that maybe they could call. Social proof reduces risk because you may or may not be aware of this. It's kind of funny. A buddy of mine um, played, uh, was a carny um, for about uh, three months one summer. And the bungee jumping ride where you go up to the top and you bungee jump and the cord bounces you back, right? Were you aware, Wes, that 50% of the time the people bungee jumping are actually paid by the own owner of the ride to bungee jump? Because is Wes or Ryan going to walk up and go, you know what? I don't see anybody jumping, but I guess I'll give it a shot. No, we want to yeah. see somebody jumping, right? Because we're risk adverse by nature. Pandemic has made us very risk adverse. Not having enough money in our bank account to fill our car has made us very risk adverse. So that's why we want to use social proof talking favorably about our other customers to our new customers, because unfortunately salespeople have a bad rap, unfortunately. So social proof is kind of where it's, where it's at as we try to navigate the uh, economic uncertainty that's in front of us, which doesn't seem to show any signs of going away anytime soon. <laughs> but I mean, that's not really new though. Right. I mean, Cialdini was talking about that 20 or 30 years ago uh, with what uh, influence yep. Yep. that the book. Yep. Influ and, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's also very cyclical. So it's not like we didn't go, th go through 06, 07, 08, but let's go back to the recession of 85, of 95. Let's go all the way back to the freaking Great Depression when post cereals thought that they owned the cereal market, cut all their advertising, and this little company from Battle Creek, Michigan steps up to the bat and says, I'm going to carpe diem this moment. And Tony the Tiger and Kellogg's dominated after the Great Depression because they advertised like crazy. They removed people's risk. They got up in front of everybody and they carpe diem in the moment. So we did that in 95. Papa John's did it, um, you know, in 06, 07. Um, heck, Domino's did it. You may remember in 06, they had a viral video that came out of, um, of bad things happening in the Papa John's kitchen. And what did they do? They doubled down in marketing, advertising, and sales, and they exited really well. So I think salespeople today that are willing to remove risk, be assertive, be bold without being brash. Those folks are really going to exit the recession or whatever we want to call it. <laughs> and they're going to be quite good. <laughs> it's those that are going to, that are weak, that are not willing to step up to the bat and have some guts. Those are the ones, Wes, I think are going to be left behind, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So um, have you done much work with like personality profiling, like disc assessments, Myers-Briggs, things like that? Yeah, a, a ton of work with it, but I've kind of gone and, and taken it just kind of a little bit more one step further. Um, and that is just, I spent a bunch of time reading Mary Ellen O'Toole, who's an FBI profiler, and really began to dig in on a lot of the profiling 
um, that was first kind of brought to sales by a company called Rain. And they've got a really good blog on it as well. And really beginning to help salespeople understand the profiles of like an analytical Al or a decisive Danielle or one of the worst collaborative Claire, um, you know, somebody that thinks you think they're going to buy from you, but they have to collaborate for like days and days to get a decision made, you know? So the personality profiling piece first comes with ego, emotional, logical, that being the three kind of easiest things to point out. Then from there, once you figure out somebody is uh, more of a logical buyer, then kind of digging in a little bit further because an analytical Al and a skeptical Steve are different. Skeptical Steve is always a skeptic and he's proud of it, right? Analytical Al just wants data, 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 data. See, I can't sell very well to analytical Al because I'm not a data guy. I like to tell stories, right? Whereas some people, they are great at selling that way. So I think the biggest thing on personality profiling is to realize that people have to stop saying, well, every buyer's different. (laughs) Okay, fine. Um, But is that really true? The cool part about LinkedIn, about the research we can do online, um, you know, um, I'm not a big believer of the folks that say, go on Facebook and see what Wes has been doing and bring up all that kind of stuff. It's creepy enough that I know your dog's name, right? But, But knowing that you went to Aruba or something, that kind of thing gets a little bit over the top. So I kind of push against those kind of folks, but there's so much technology out there. Why are we not using it to our advantage? A lot of folks just don't because they don't want to be a pro. They want to be an amateur. Professionals practice and amateurs wing it. Amateurs show up right before a sales call. They're on their phone. Oh, who is this guy? Professionals prepared last week for the meeting they're having today. Mm -hmm. Um, Tiger Woods could, you know, um, 16 surgeries later could beat me with a butter knife. Uh, playing golf because professionals practice and amateurs wing it. Mm -hmm. I want people to be pros at this job because it can make you a lot of money if you want to be a pro. Yeah. The, so, you know, the reason I was asking is, you know, you talk about, you know, millennials that they want social proof, you know, they want to know who else is using it. Um, you know, in lumping people together, right. Through the disc and like, you know, your, your drivers, your dominance, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or traditionally like they want to be the, the bleeding edge. They don't care who else is using it. They want to be the first to use it. You know, do, do you see those attitudes shifting? Like that does the environment, right. The pandemic, the recession, does it just like, is it a wet blanket kind of on everybody? So even the hard, typically hard charging types, are a little more reserved, a little more um, looking for reassurances than than normal? I have not found that people change who they are because of the pandemic. I found that they actually get a little bit worse. So what I find is those that are really, really, really logical, they tend to be risk adverse and get even more logical. I have found that emotional people, already emotional, tend to get even more emotional and take it to a whole new level. So that's why I feel like you have to really research in advance of the call to make sure that you can find some connection points with these folks. Because unfortunately, like the customer needs assessments um, don't necessarily uh, deal with emotional, ego, logical. Um, They tend to, the same salespeople ask the same questions all the time, regardless of who they're meeting with. So I feel like through the pandemic, people that were ugly just got uglier. People that, and this is my opinion, people that were emotional just got even more emotional. So I don't know that anybody went from ugly to happy or happy. I think people that are happier might've been a little more sad, but I noticed that my folks that I'm around that were extremely positive, they went from a 10 to a nine, but that nine is still higher than most people's five. And so because of that, I just don't know that those charismatic sales reps got hurt quite as bad, Mm -hmm. but they may be disconnected from Mm -hmm. the people potentially that they're that they're selling to. Yeah. So it's funny. I haven't seen the, the CNA in a while, um, <laughs> but I, I, mean, I remember, I mean, you know, and I, I do them. I just, I guess I don't use that name. Sure. Um, can you elaborate on that? People that may not have heard of a customer needs assessment, like how, how, how do you recommend they use them in this current environment? So the customer needs assessment, sometimes cloaked as the 10 tall questions, you know, never asking a question you don't know the answer to, never asking an open-ended yes or no question, those kind of things. 
So it's called a customer needs assessment. The problem is the questions you ask normally determine what somebody wants, not what somebody needs. So it really should be called a customer wants assessment. Here's the problem, in my opinion, is that you do want to get to their needs, but you have to guide them towards their needs. If you give somebody what they want, you have a client for a very short period of time. If you guide them towards what they need to do with your company, then you potentially have a customer for a lifetime. And it applies to selling advertising or selling software or whatever. If I give somebody what they want, I'm selling them a car. My uncle's been very successful in the car business for 45 years. If you give them what you want, you think you're doing the right thing. But if you were, to, if I go to the car lot, you give me what I want. It's going to hold two people. You couldn't put groceries in the back seat. Um, it's going to be really fast and it's going to make me look really good. Or so I, I feel. It's important for the salesperson to take me beyond my wants and take me to my needs. Like, do you ever go to the grocery store? Do you ever go to Lowe's and pick up anything to fix at your home? Because, sir, you're not going to be able to fit uh, a, a, a wrench in the back seat of that cool sports car. Right. So I think that the best salespeople out there are great at understanding what somebody wants, but they know that to have a customer for a lifetime, they have to guide them towards what they need. Don't be ugly about it or don't be a... Uh, for lack of a better term, kind of a Debbie Downer for it. But I really believe that the great salespeople out there hear what somebody wants, advise them towards what they need to do without being a downer. So that in the end, you have customers for a lifetime because one of the problems I see in the sales business, Wes, is that people are always concerned about the immediate sale. And you and I both know, because we've been doing this a while, you got to work as hard to keep the sale as you did to get the sale, Right. And a lot of folks are so focused on selling right here, right now, that they don't think about the long-term ramifications. It takes five times the money and energy to get a new client. Why are yeah. we not, like if I ask people, what's your retention plan? They're like, oh, we offer great customer service. Everybody offers customer service. What do you do above and beyond the sale to keep these customers around for a lifetime? So I'm really concerned about the questioning happening out there. I think a lot of the questioning was written by old sales dogs um, that need to be learning some new tricks. And a lot of the questioning is is really overused. Like, I love this one. <laughs> uh, so, Wes, I've uh, got a question for you. You know, what what keeps you up at night? <laughs> My dog. <laughs> why, do you, why do you ask? <laughs> uh, you know, My eight-year-old Wes, still comes into my room. Right. Leave me alone, kid. You know, Wes, when you wake up in the middle of the night as a business owner in a cold sweat, what's that one thing you're thinking about? <laughs> it's like... Where do these questions come from? I swear the eighties are calling. They want them all back. <laughs> I, I distinctly remember the first time I heard that, um, what keeps you awake at night? And it was the CEO I was working for. He was the president of my previous company. He got, he got started at this company in Austin and that's where I was living. So I went to work for him and he, he threw that question out there in one of our meetings and in 2004, and I was like, oh, that's a good question, you know, but yeah. So 18 years ago, that was a good question. Right. Um, right. It's, you got to be careful how you use that today. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. I, 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 you know what, some, I'm asking some different questions and I'd love yeah. for your listeners to think about a couple that they may or may not like. People don't grant you meetings out of curiosity anymore. Um, if they're going to buy a CRM or whatever, normally they've done enough research in advance. They need you to close the gap for them, answer some questions. So I like this question. Um, you know, Wes, thank you for this meeting. When you granted me this meeting, I'm sure there was something you were kind of hoping I could help you solve. You know, how, how can I be of help to you today? Mm -hmm. Rather than just digging in on what my CRM is that I'm selling or what vitamin I'm selling or what piece of advertising I'm selling. There's got to be a reason that you granted me this meeting. I'm so thankful for it. How can I help you? And I believe that when you position yourself as a helper, it removes that sales uh, tattoo from your from your forehead. Um, I have two tattoos that are most people can't see on my forehead. One is, if you're over the age of 80, please talk to me. I love talking to old people. And the other is, you're in sales. It says that and only, only other salespeople can see it, right? So I feel like there's um, there's other questions that we should be asking that are better that will help us connect more deeply with people than hey, what keeps you up at night? I think it's just a little bit too broad. And in some ways it comes across in kind of a weird way. Yeah. Yeah, I just kind of figured it out naturally. Like I, 
you know, I talk about the, the new ABCs of selling, you know, one of them is always be concise. Mm -hmm. oh, right. Uh, I struggle with that, to be honest. So I've just always, I, I've never wanted to be that rambling gong, you know, that talking head. Uh, and if I don't know somebody, you know, like, what do you do? You know, I'll just, I'll throw something out. Like if I'm just at a social thing, like I realize that could be a prospect. This could be the VP of some major corporation. So, um, but they, they could be just making small talk, you know? And so I'm not going to go crazy. So I'm like, you know, I help people with sales and marketing. You know, what do you do? And I'll turn it around on them. And then I, if they're curious, you know, you see them perk up. What do you mean sales and marketing? <laughs> right. And so I said, well, it's, you know, big companies, small companies. I'll, and I'll turn it around. Are you in sales? You know, yes. As a matter of fact. Oh, okay. So I'll just by, by not overwhelming them, I can, I, I want to hone it in, you know, if it's CRMs, if it's, you know, they're in marketing, they got a sales meeting, they're looking for a keynote speak or whatever. I, so I want to, I want to help them narrow the focus. Then we can go deep. But before then, like, I want to cast this wide net and not, but you know, like we were at a, at a, like on a little four-year-old's birthday party and my wife knows them, but I haven't met the husband. He's a firefighter. And so I met him, you know, finally, but everybody there are firefighters. Ah. You know, so it's like, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I do know a lot of firefighters and a lot of them have a side hustle, right? So yep. I, I'm not going to assume that just because they're in, in firefighters, they don't have a side business, but I'm also not going to assume that they do because not everyone does, you know, so I'm, I'm going right. to take it, take it easy. If we're just going to have a beer and eat some cake. Okay. I'm cool with that. I don't have to get into it, you right. know, but I, I do want to keep the door open, but by being concise, you know, right. if they're curious, they'll, they'll perk up. Then I can just answer the questions that they are truly interested in. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, I'm where I run into problems is on airplanes that travel all the time. Speaking to these conferences, you sit down next to somebody and, and they'll, Hey buddy, what do you, what do you do for a living? And so I'm always careful because if you say that you're a sales consultant, then they want to talk sales. Right. So I normally say, um, I'm a, I'm a professional assassin and you, and they, they kind of look back at me like, they're like, no, you're joking. I said, no, you know, I usually say I'm an accountant or something because I just want to have a cocktail and continue on with the flight. But it's interesting, this number of sales conversations, when I do say to someone, hey, I speak at sales conferences, I write books and I still sell today. Oh, no kidding. Well, I'm in sales. It's all the time. Um, tell me your tricks. Tell me your tips. Tell me your, you know, your ideas. But I love, you know, what I like, um, Wes, knowing you the short period of time is your cadence. I think that your cadence is attractive because most salespeople come across with a super fast kind of crazy cadence. And I like your cadence, the speed at which you ask questions and talk. I feel like it really resonates with a lot of people because I tend to have a problem with that. I talk too fast. I talk too much. Come across as a salesperson. I like your cadence because you come across as being real and let's take our time and get to know each other. I like it. Uh, I like it a lot. So I think that there's different, uh, as you would say, uh, or as they used to say, kind of different strokes for different folks. I think everybody's got to find their sales game. But if the sales game that you're doing is a game from 86 mm. and you've gone through this pandemic and now it's just a different, you're, you're going to have to update your sales game if you're going to be successful. It's not that you're not going to sell. I just think there's others going to sell more because yeah. they're not going to ask, what's your budget? Are you the decision maker? And what's your timeline? All three of those questions, Forbes said, common sales questions, all of them rate um, as some of the worst questions to ask because nobody wants to be asked, what's your budget? Are you the decision maker? And what's your timeline? Mm -hmm. So we've got to come up with um, better questions or different questions to ask, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the grand scheme of rapport building and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I covered that today. I got up my Monday morning call and, and but I'm always telling people. It's so like, we do need to know what the budget is. Uh, mm -hmm. We do need to know mm -hmm. who the decision makers are, but you can't mm -hmm. just ask it. Like that's the art, right? You know, and, and so we hate to assume, right? We're going to get in trouble when we assume. But one of the few assumptions that I make is that you have a team, mm -hmm. right? So I'll say, hey, Ryan, you know, when, when you're kicking around this idea, when you're you know, reviewing CRMs and looking to make a change like this, like who in your team, like, do you bounce things off of? 
you know, to make sure you're making the right decision. So I'm going to promote you, you know, because you're going to tell me one of two things. <laughs> oh, dude, I wish I had a team. You know, it used to be three <laughs> of us. I'm doing the job of three people. This is all me. So I'm like, fantastic. Now you can't later come back and say, well, let me bounce this off the team. I'm like, whoa, back up the bus there, Bubba. Right. You know, at at 11, 13 a.m. on Monday, August 1st, you said you were doing the job of three people. Did I misunderstand you? Right. Because <laughs> I'm going to put the screws to you if now you're lying to me because right. I ain't playing that game. Right. Right. And so or convert, you know, on, on the budget, you know, it's like, hey, man, like, do you have any idea how much this is going to cost? You know, so you got to kind of soften. No, well, budget's not a problem. When right. they say that, budget is a problem. Correct. You know, so I'll mess with them. Oh, cool. So like, like $10 million, I can just throw that out there. And I mean, because I can do a lot of work for $10 million. Oh, you're crazy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So less than $10 million, but more than 10000 Right. You know, I'll play that game. I'll get them. I'll, I'll find a range. You know, but it's that's a long time of doing this, you know, because that's that's the art of just knowing how and when to kind of verbalize that and box them in because most salespeople, they just go in blind. Right. They're right. Just just shooting from the hip and it's like, good grief, dude. Good luck with that. Right. They're being amateurs. I mean, you want to be yeah. a professional in sales. You can't be winging it, especially in today's uh, highly skilled selling environment. You can't wing it yet. Nobody wants to, and I don't like to role play per se, but I know, understand the premise of blocking and tackling to make sure that you go to the game field prepared. I understand the idea behind mission readiness that you train and train and train and train so that when the, you know, what hits the fan, you're falling back on your, on your training yet in sales. It's yeah, I read that book or um, I'm great in front of my clients but I'm not great in front of you, Wes. Wes, you scare me. I I, I can't <laughs> practice or block and tackle with you. You know, I'm, I'm sure you probably have some sales leaders that listen to the to to your show. And one of the things for the sales leaders out there, in, in my humble opinion, is you've got to present role playing as something that's mission critically important. It's all about training them to be able to handle the various situations, just like um you know, my son does, or my family does in the, in the military being mission ready, or are you mission ready? But, you know, sometimes I have sales reps, Wes, they won't even make a call until they have every answer. Yeah. Well, some of it is you got to get out in the field and, you know, get bumped, bumped into a few times before you realize, oh, wow, that kind of hurts. I need to prepare better, you know, uh, really for that. I just find that a lot of sales folks, they want to wing it and they want to be successful, but um, I call it the Tom Brady principle and I'm not a fan of Tom Brady because, you know, he always plays against my, my favorite teams, but um, he, he's a winner and a champion because he looks for things that he can repeat and he rinses and repeats those things. He looks for things that don't work and doesn't keep doing them over and over again. <laughs> right. And so I think that Tom Brady principle really rings true um, in, in sales. Um, and I talk about that a lot. Look for things that you can rinse and repeat, look for patterns of things that create profit for you and rinse and repeat those things and stop, stop this whole nonsense of, uh, li Hey Wes, live every day. Like it's a new day, you know, or live every day. Like it's your last day. Listen, buddy, if this is my last day, you're a great guy, but I, hey, I'm not talking to you. I'm out doing something. I, if it's my last day, I mean, some Krispy Kreme, dude, I'm eating Krispy Kreme all day <laughs> and washing down with a big, big, strong bourbon because it's the last day I'm going to live. Right. Um, or I'm going to be spending all the time with my family or, or whatever. So I feel yeah. like the premise of all this is, um, you know, look at the copyright of the books you're reading because there are books um, written that can help you post pandemic selling through economic uncertainty and be careful about some of the advice from the seventies and eighties, because a lot of it, and even nineties, a lot of it was designed around widget selling, widget based selling. And unfortunately our sales are more complex now. Um, and because of that, we just have to be better prepared. It's amazing to me the number of folks that aren't trained in the sales business. They oh, yeah. might have a mentor, but they're definitely not trained, you know, unfortunately. So hopefully to listen to your show, it'll help them out. <laughs> yeah. I've always said I, I rehabilitate salespeople and train their managers. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, um, I said, um, uh, I'm a sales therapist. So what, is, what does that mean? I said, well, I, I help salespeople that 
need therapy that a normal professional therapist is not going to want to give <laughs> sales therapy. And what do you charge for that? When I told them, they're like, well, you're more expensive than my attorney. I said, listen, your attorney costs you money. I make you money. Yeah. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> Amen. So uh, from Iowa kid to Emmy award winner to fortune 500 advisor. Somebody paid somebody a lot of money to write that. Yeah. I grew up on a hog farm, a pig farm in Iowa. Have you ever been to a pig farm, Wes? I, my grandfather raised a couple of pigs just on his little one acre retirement land, but it wasn't a, a pig farm, but I have slopped pigs. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a stinky proposition. Um, that's for sure. But growing up in Iowa, I live just outside of Augusta, Georgia now. Um, in a little town that James Brown lived in almost his, his adult, entire adult life called Beach Island, South Carolina. By the way, I said to somebody the other day, I, I lived where James Brown lived most of his life. And they said, who's James Brown? Mm. I thought, oh boy. Okay. Do you know Elvis? You know, you poor thing. But uh, growing up on a farm gave me a work ethic that is translated into the sales business um, because sales is tough. If it wasn't tough, everybody would be doing it. It is a tough gig, but it's it's... I kind of go where I want to go and drive what I want to drive and eat what I want to drive because of sales, kind of. Um, so I feel like it's a great business for us to be in for willing to to ebb and flow with the world that's dropped upon us and just realize that we might have to change our game a little bit if we're going to be crazy kind of successful. And I don't think there's anything wrong with change. I mean, heck, I've been married 27 years and I changed six times yesterday uh, just to, you know, just to keep my my bride happy. That's for sure. Hey, I'm going on 27 years next month. Hey, dynamite. Well, uh, good for you. I, I, a guy the other day said, I've been married 45 years. And um, his uh, wife said, um, I'm I'm his second wife. Okay. He can't just add them all up. Okay. Uh, damn. That's like, you know, they <laughs> say, uh, you know, we've been married, you know, 20 wonderful years, like 27 years, honey. Well, only 20 have been wonderful. You know? <laughs> what was really kind of, what was the, what was the beginning like? You know, that's for sure. Why do you, I wonder if, if you may have a thought on this, I've yet to wrap my head around why it is that salespeople just don't want to change. Is it because they, they just consistently have done the same thing and it's worked and they just don't want to mess it up or, or do you feel like people just get in bad ruts and they just don't want to want to change based on new advice or new numbers that are presented to them? What do you think? I think most salespeople fall into sales. I don't think they start out. You know, very few people go to school saying, I want to become a salesperson. Oh, that's interesting. So they fall into sales and then through luck or hard work or combination of both, they, they are moderately successful. So they, they survive. And <clears throat> then it's just human nature, right? We're arrogant, we're lazy, um, we're gluttonous. So we just, we coast, we do the minimum. You know, like any job, right? People, they start taking it for granted. Then, you know, you, you put on a, on a PIP, right? Performance right. improvement plan. You perk up. Yep. I don't care if you're a plumber, a gardener, salesperson. And uh, so, yeah, they just don't want to change. But again, they, they kind of fell into it. And then they think, you know, past performance is indicative of future results. So, but, but it's not companies all the time they go hire somebody with a rolodex with experience and it's like that's no guarantee they're going to do well for you you know but that just it just persists and um you know people fail forward yeah <laughs> yeah yeah fail forward fail often yeah I, I really agree with you um that a lot of times folks just now there is a um the university of whitewater wisconsin actually has a minor in sales i hired a guy we're working yeah, with a couple guy schools went, do i think there's one yeah. in florida does I think UCF or somebody does have a minor, I think, in in sales. Yeah. And what's interesting is uh, recently I ran across a very, very great uh, young sales professional. And she was so excited. She went to the new employer. This is the absolute truth. She said, um, uh, I just want to sell. He said, excuse me. She said, I just want to sell. She is still, uh, she was six months in before they actually started having her sell. And she came in saying, I want to sell. I want to be in sales. And it was so rare to hear that, that I think kind of the employer was like, I, I don't even know what to do with this person. All they want to do yeah. is sell. What do I do? Well, they give, they, they hide, you know, I'm an account executive. I'm going to, uh, 
home buying coordinator, whatever, you're a salesperson. Right. Right. Stop hiding from this. It's not a bad thing. But as long as you hide from it, then you're going to you're going to have this little nagging voice. It's like driving with your emergency brake on. You're not going to do as well as you could. Right. Uh, so accept it for what it is. You know, I always say like nobody, you know, we like to beat up on used car salesmen and attorneys, whatever. But when you need a good car at a good price, when you need an attorney, you sure are happy when you know a good one. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, so be a good one. Right. And, you it's know, not a matter can, of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. You'd say you can make as much money as you want and live the life you want. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say it's not a matter of uh, if you're going to need an attorney, it's when you're going to need an attorney. And I recently had a couple, I, I, after writing this book, I have a couple of haters online. So I was really upset about it. And I was listening to Grant Cardone talk about haters on one of his podcasts, or I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> and uh, he said, hey, man, he said, if you don't have at least 10 haters, you're nobody. So I'm like, oh, I only have three. So I'm nobody. But I mean, I'm going to get to 10, you know, <laughs> at some point. Yeah, he, he's certainly on the extreme, man. I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you know, Dan Kennedy would say, you know, if, if you don't piss somebody off by noon, you're not marketing. Right. Right. If you haven't been sued at least once, you know, you, do you have a really successful business, you know, or not, <laughs> if you don't have a business that's worth, you know, that's worth suing over, do you really have a real business? Yeah. I also feel like I wish there were more opportunities, um, to bring salespeople together besides just podcasts and, and that so that, um, folks can get together and, and kind of share. Um, in our victories and share in our struggles. There's not enough conferences or get togethers just for sales professionals. Hey, what are you doing? What are you learning? What are you seeing out there? Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's really great to have the, you know, the sales whisper uh, podcast, the other podcasts out there. So I can kind of hear what's happening out there uh, in the world. So I don't feel like I'm alone and friends that are listening. I mean, you're not alone. You got folks yeah. like Wes and I that are warriors out there with you going through this struggle, um, paying our bills because of sales. Um, I, you know, I, I always kind of joke about it. I love it when I talk to people that continuously sell because it's difficult to train folks if you're not selling right now, because it's just a yeah. different environment and you're dealing with different people. Yeah. Uh, just turned, just turned 50. Um, very proud of it. Um, but, um, I'm realizing that I'm leaving a certain group behind and I've got to pay more attention to the younger buyer set because I kind of get in my own head and I've got to really pay attention. So any folks that are listening, if you're like me, 50, over the age of 50, just recognize that there's nothing wrong with changing a little bit. Um, yeah. You make more money if you're willing to get into flow with these younger buyers. And I do believe that millennials have made me a better salesperson. They have. Yeah. And yeah. I appreciate them for that. Yeah. Very cool. And if they get your book, they'll be better salespeople. They will. And, you know, I know a lot of folks, um, you know, do like little charity things with their books. And and I don't know, they put a lot of thought into it. But very briefly, my uh, grew up on an Iowa farm, didn't have a lot of money. My dad was a part time preacher, part time farmer. And I remember one day very vividly, I was in the sixth, seventh grade. I go to the pantry to get some food after school and there was a can of corn. And that was it, Wes, a can of corn. Now, we never went, uh, you know, we never went hungry. I don't ever remember ever missing a meal. Um, I remember my family struggling, but my goal in in uh, in doing a charity project with all my books is that no one will ever open the pantry and just see one can of corn. I mean, what's a kid going to do with a can of corn, right? Um, besides, I guess, maybe try to eat it. So the Selling Forward book is, is all about sales, but the, all the net proceeds are going to go to the Golden Harvest Food Bank and to Feeding America. Um, I've got other ways to, to make money, which I'm very blessed for that. But the Selling Forward book, yeah, 100% of the net proceeds are going to the Golden Harvest Food Bank and Feeding America. So I'd love for folks to get on Amazon or Audible or whatever, get a copy of it and uh, great reviews. And I think it's going to be helpful. Um, so thanks for letting me pimp that. A little yeah, bit man. So uh, we're, we're linking to it in the show notes. I've got it on the blog um, where we review this, linking to your website. So Ryan Dorn with an H, right? Yeah. D-O-H-R-N. Got it. And they can learn more about you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for the thanks for the time and thanks for the uh, engaging conversation. I hope people will walk away from it going, gosh, I do really enjoy being in sales. Get excited about it. <laughs> it is the number one profession in the world. It's there not the oldest go. profession. It's not the oldest profession. Oh, no. Um, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> I was going to say, unless no, I, you consider I, no, those that worked I, in brothels were salespeople. <laughs> hey, exactly. I've had this discussion more than once. And really? Look, it may have been an easy sale. But they did have to come to terms, and <laughs> and 
and it's it, they call, it's like the prostitute theory or principle or whatever but basically the value of services the perceived value of services rendered are greatly diminished once the service has been performed so they negotiate right. up front and they get paid up front so selling right. is the right. oldest profession so you can so your next book is going to be called the prostitute principle um okay. go ahead and take it and copyright it um all right that... <laughs> all right I'm typing all the, it right all, now. Listen, all the great advice that we all the, so you're going to go get that dot com name marcia all the advice that we gave you know for the last 60 minutes is out the window because everybody is going to register uh prostitute that's what they're going to get so <laughs> yeah well there's uh Oh, I got to go to the Goodness. chiropractor. I'm so jacked up from jujitsu right now. I, I got to turn my whole body. Uh, one of my books, uh, I'm rearranging the office. So I'm moving books, but it was a uh, Sydney Barrows or something like that. Uh, but she was a no kidding prostitute. Uh, I don't know if she was a prostitute, but she was a, a madam. And she wrote a mm -hmm. book with Dan Kennedy, like the triple X sales secrets or something like that. No kidding. Uh, yeah, this is a very good book. It, I mean, it's like 20 years old. Um, I'm immediately like going to Amazon to find it. It looks like it's like brown paper. Like they, they did the cover to kind of look like that. And like the triple X is kind of uh, pulled out, uh, you know, all in red. Um, oh, what is her name? Uh, I got to look it up while we're still talking. But, I'm uh, sort of glad to know that you don't have her name memorized. It's sort sort of part of me feels like it's good that you don't have her. Her name uh, memorized. Do, do, do. Oh, <laughs> I'll have to look it up. I'll shoot you a note. Yeah, but, no, that's uh, great. Yeah, it was it was really good. And um, you know, I've talked about this. I've one of my main slides I give in almost every talk. It have a pipeline. You know, say dating equals sales. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have your stages. You know, make eye contact. Ask her to dance. You know, get her phone number. Go on dates two to twenty-two. Meet the family. Pick out yeah. rings. Get engaged. Get married. Have a baby. Right? right. So, there's a, and you can skip a couple of steps, but yeah, you, know, you can skip one. If you skip two or more, you're kind of playing yeah. with fire. You know, yeah. you meet and go right to the Elvis Chapel. Right. Those have worked out. Most yeah. have not. Right. You know, and in sales, you, if you skip too many steps, there's something's going to come back and bite you in the butt. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it is it is a process. It is moderately predictable. It's just a matter of people kind of taking some new information, um, like what I've got here in this book and other books that you can read and these podcasts, taking that information and just being willing to change your sales game a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with change. Stop being resistant to it. And I think people will be crazy successful out there in the sales business. Found it. Found it. Oh. Mayflower Madam, ah. Sydney Biddle Barrows. And it was so with Dan was Kennedy? 2009. So she wrote it with him. Uh, Uncensored sales strategies, a radical new approach to selling your customers what they really want, no matter what business you're in. So it's it looks like a brown wrapper, right? Like that, you know, the adult magazine would be in. And the, so it's ripped off. And so it's in red, uncensored sales strategies. And it's triple X rated secrets is what they, so I knew there was a triple X in there somewhere. Uh, go, so, yeah, she uh, was a real person. I mean, she was arrested uh, for being, you know, the Mayflower Madam. And wow, then, how about that? And turned her life around. So yeah, there you head, go. Over, head over to Amazon, get you two books uh, today, <laughs> free delivery, and uh, make sure you explain what the one is all about. That's for yeah, sure. <laughs> exactly. All well, right, man. Ryan Dorn. You, brother. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for all coming right. on. It's been great. Appreciate you very, very much. Thanks so much. You can increase your overall productivity by 150% by setting time limits and time blocking your day. Amen. Forever and ever and ever, I've been chunking my time. Even when I was still a quota carrying W-2 employee salesperson, my default meeting is 15 minutes. That's been that way forever. Google taught me how to shorten my meetings i've got this like efficiency setting or something on calendar so my my 30 minute meetings are set for 25 my one hour meetings are set for 55 but it's rare they have a one hour meeting certainly not a get to know you meeting those are 15 minutes so be organized chunk your time right over 60 percent of buyers will make 75 percent of their buying decision before they request to to talk to a salesperson your prospects are doing their own research 
our roles have changed as salespeople. If you don't know that and you don't recognize how you're in trouble, you're working harder than you should, the sales are taking longer than they should, and they're smaller than they can be, should be. Okay, you're leaving money on the table. You got to figure that out. Okay. If you need help with ideas on how to chunk your time and how to schedule, check out 12 Weeks to Peak. If you want to get busy with um, actual training, check out MakeEverySale.com. Super affordable on-demand training. If you want to talk to me every week for a quarter or up to a year and save almost 50%, then that is SellMoreOfEverything.com. Come join us. You can engage in the group, ask questions every week. I'm going to help you, all right? It's what I do. But now i got to go eat some dinner and go to my reunion. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.